It's a privilege for me to introduce one of our grads who probably has as an extensive ministry as any of our grads I've ever had in uh, so many areas. Dr. Elmer Towns is a college and seminary professor. He's an author of both popular and scholarly works. He's been a seminar lecturer, a dedicated worker in uh, Sunday school. He's developed over 20 resource packets for leadership education. He began teaching at the Midwest Bible College in St. Louis, Missouri. Wasn't satisfied with the textbooks, so he started writing his own. He's, he's uh, one of the co-founders, in fact, the co-founder along with uh, Dr. Jerry Falwell of Liberty University. And he was the only and first and hence first and only full-time teacher in the first year of Liberty's existence. He's the Dean Emeritus of the School of Religion and is also the Dean Emeritus of Liberty Baptist Theological Seminary. He uh, has a Bachelor's of Arts from Northwestern College in Minneapolis, an MA from uh, SMU here in Dallas, a THM from Dallas Theological Seminary, an MRE from the Garrett Theological Seminary of Evanston, Illinois, and a D-Men from the Fuller Theological Seminary in Pasadena, California. He and his wife Ruth have three children and 10 grandchildren. He's been a prolific author, a sought out speaker. He's been all over the world, has influenced so many. Would you join me in welcoming to our platform this morning here in our chapel, Dr. Elmer Towns. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's a privilege to be back here, and I'm going to speak this morning on praying God's Word. Around 10 years ago, one morning, I was reading one of the Psalms, and I didn't like the way it was coming across. And so I used my favorite research assistant, Google, <laughs> to find the Hebrew text and read it. And I want you to know, I took four years of Hebrew, a snap. I took four years of Greek, agony. Greek was very hard. Hebrew was very easy. It's left and right brain kind of a thing. And so I, I, I don't call myself a Greek scholar or a Hebrew scholar, but I call myself a journeyman. I love the word and I read the word. And, uh, and so I've translated the entire Bible. This is called a modern translation. It's basically a paraphrase. We've tried to turn the Bible into prayers. And so um, I began by translating some of the Psalms. And then I did the entire Psalms, and it was published by Destiny Image, and it sold rather well. Then I did Proverbs, and that sold rather well. Then I did a book called Praying Job. It was terrible in sales. Nobody wants to pray with Job. <laughs> <laughs> so I decided to do the entire Bible. Three years ago, I was not getting, it was gonna take much longer. I talked to Roy Zook. And Roy's been my copy editor. Is Ken Zook here today? Ken, did you arrive? His son was going to be here today and did not arrive. And so I said, Roy, it's not going well. Help me out. He said, okay, I'll do. I'll do half. He did the Old Testament except the poetical books. I did the new. And so this is a book that's um, sold rather well. It's, uh, we had a good launch this fall in uh, uh, Malbark, Costco, Target, Lifeway. And so we're happy for that. It's a a new modern translation. And so I have a copy of a faculty, I have a copy for every faculty member here today. And so faculty, if you'll come up and pick it up. And on the back table as you go out, there's a copy called Walking in Giants. That's for every student who is here. And so um, that's not necessarily an autobiography, which tells your whole life. It's memoirs. I tell about what God has done in my life. The good things, the great things, and the mistakes I've made. You see, you don't really understand your life until you understand the mistakes and what you learn from them. And when God shuts the door and slams the door front, and when you learn from those. And so I, I appreciate the opportunity of coming back today. And I would like to present this to, you, this to you, Dr. Bailey. And I'd like you to ask you to have prayer that God would use this book to touch many lives as they open the Bible and they do more than read the Bible. They read and pray at the same time. Would you pray for the Bible? Thank you. Yes. Thank you very much. Father, thank you for the work that has been done uh, to put this into print. We ask that you would use it in many lives as we uh, uh, basically abide in you and let your word abide in us. 
And uh, you tell us that one of the byproducts is, a is asking what we will and it'll be done. Uh, that's when we pray according to your will. So may this book, may this translation of the entire Bible be used to stimulate better prayer and a better abiding of your word in us and us in you, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Dr. Tennis. Thank you, Dr. Bailey. When I was a student here, I had dreams. I was asked to go teach at the old Dallas Bible College. It was uh, about a half a block away from here, and I taught there. And when I was going through Dallas, I also went through SMU at the same time. I had tried to get into Fuller Seminary. My heart's desire was to go into Fuller Seminary. And so I went to Columbia Bible College, wrote a letter, and they turned me down. It's not accredited. And I knew Dr. Charles Woodbridge, a teacher there. He said, I'll get you in. And he wrote back and said, sorry, not accredited. Go to, go to a liberal arts college, not a Bible college. So my father-in-law sent me up to Northwestern College. He said, Billy Graham is president there. It'll be a great place to go. Well, I got there and Billy Graham resigned. <laughs> and it was not accredited. And I found out, I said, Lord, I'm going to spend a long, cold, dark winter's night in Minneapolis. What am I going to learn? Paul Hake, one of the graduates of, of Dallas, had us over to his house, all the graduates. And so we're in his backyard in the springtime enjoying a cookout. And he walked us into his basement. And on this basement was his desk. And he had piled up a stack of books from the desk all the way to the ceiling. And he began to show us. He said, this book, if you go to Fuller, you'll study it. And if you stay at Northwestern Seminary, you'll study it. If you go here, you'll study it. And I'm thinking, yeah, yeah. He said, now, all of these books are written by Dallas men. And if you go to Dallas, you can study the man. I went to Dallas. And I studied the men. And I said, Dallas men write books. <laughs> and so I'm going to start writing books. And so I learned some things in Dallas. And God opened the door. So I went to SMU to get an accredited degree. Dallas was not accredited in those days. And so I had one accredited degree that got me a teaching position and at Midwest Bible College, small college. But as I said here, I had dreams of teaching at a big college somewhere. I said, Lord, I'd like to teach at a big Christian college. If I could have a class of 300 Bible students teaching the Bible, what would that mean? Well, God led me to many different places. And eventually, Jerry Falwell said, come help start a, bi a college for me. And he was talking about a Bible college. I said, no, you want to start a liberal arts college. He said, oh, no, not liberal, not liberal. And I had to tell him what a liberal arts college was. And so when we started the college, he said, Elmer, I'll raise the money. I'll build the buildings. He said, I'll recruit the students. You write the catalog. He said, you hire the faculty. You schedule the classes. Together, we'll build the biggest college biggest Christian college in the world. Now, we thought that would be about 5,000. Bob Jones in those days had 4,500. And so we said, let's go for 5,000. And uh, later, he said, let's go for 50,000. And then I want you to know, on Friday of last week, we're talking about four or five days ago, we brought all the faculty together, all the staff together, everyone together. We reached 100,000 online students. And on addition, in, in campus, we have 13,770. And so when we think of what God has done, and I began so many times praying for money. Oh, God, give us money. And, um, and God blessed the school. We almost lost it two or three times. We had a federal uh, suit against us. Uh, we had other people. We, we almost lost the school, but God did a miracle. And today, the school is prospering. The budget for Liberty University is one billion a year. Can you say the word B? <laughs> one, uh, you, you sit here and think, I can't even get money to pay my tuition. I don't have money to do things. I want you to know that God is concerned about you and helping you. And I believe that God helped me get through school, uh, provided people get me uh, tuition, money to get through school. And I think God can do a miracle for a student here today if you'll just believe and trust him. I'd like to speak to you today on the whole area of praying the scriptures. There's so many different things you can say about praying, but pray the Bible. 
If you pray the words to God, and so I'm going to ask you, let's put it on the screen, the outline for today. And so on the screen, when you look at the outline, it basically says praying the scripture. When you learn to pray the scriptures, it's kind of like the person who said he prays and he, when he go in, uh, you, you think of a lawyer going before a judge. And the lawyer says, but, but judge, the law says, and so when you get to the law says, you have the authority. The law says, let my man go free. And so when you begin to pray what God has said in the word, you pray with a new authority, not your authority, not your spirituality, not your much speaking or loud speaking, but you pray with the authority of scripture. When you pray what God has said, you will, you will move heaven and you will move God. And the second thing about praying, when you begin to pray, oh, one, one other thing. You remember when you were a kid and you'd fuss with your sister, fuss with your brother, and then you say, but mama said. Now that's ultimate authority. But daddy said, no, but when mama says, that's the ultimate authority. So when you begin to pray, you not only pray with authority, you make your prayers answerable. You make your prayers answerable because you are praying with scripture. When I went to Columbia Bible College, I had just been converted. And I went off to Columbia Bible College to be a preacher, a Presbyterian preacher. And when I was there, I began to say, hmm, if I'm gonna be a preacher, I gotta marry, a, I gotta find a wife. She's gotta play the piano. And so I asked this girl out for a date and she said, no, no, I gotta, I gotta write a paper on Friday night. And I said, who writes papers on Friday night? <laughs> I asked another girl for a date. She said, no, I've gotta wash my hair. Now I understand no, <laughs> it, it's, it was hidden in couch, but I understand no. And so I got in with a group of navigators, men who had been in World War II. They got me praying together writing scripture, and they started me on a prayer journal. I want you to know, I have every page in my prayer journal from January 1971 till today. And I, you can trace the history of the growth of liberty. When we prayed for property, when we prayed for that first building, when we prayed for, uh, matter of fact, this summer I went over and I, I went to dorm number one and they tore it down. And I remember that was $100,000. And we prayed and begged God, and we got $100,000 and 38 students. We tore it down and we built a 14 story building. I forget how many thousand are gonna be in that 14 story dormitory building. And then I went over to our first classroom building. It cost us $100,000. And I can remember showing up at seven o'clock one morning, starting my Theology 201 and begin praying. And so last spring, before they tore the building down, they had me in at the very last class, at the end of the very last class in that building, I prayed the benediction. I can trace what God has done through my prayer journal. These men got me praying, and so I said, hmm, you ought to write down. And so I began to say, Lord, I need a wife. And I wrote down, hmm, it ought to be, it ought to be she ought to be spiritual, she ought to be smart, she ought to be talented. So this girl stood in the very center of the choir and she was pretty and she sang in the trio and she could play the piano and she was on the Dean's list and her father had a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> so I wrote down Ruth Jean Forbes and I began to bang on the window and say, Oh God, Oh God, make her say yes, make her say yes, make her say yes. <laughs> and I, I'm just begging God. And so I, I walk down the hall and she's coming. I said, this is it. Oh, God, help me. I said, hi, Ruth. How about going out with me on Friday night? She said, sure, why not? <laughs> amen, amen, amen. <laughs> I, have, I have that piece of paper today to show that I was in the will of God. Now, I want you to know, 10 months later, she got from the middle of the paper to the top of the paper, Ruth Jean Forbes' marriage. I said, oh, God, make her say yes, make her say yes. Well, I did what I'm supposed to do. I got a poem. I got a rose, I got on my knees. I said, Ruth, will you marry me? She said, sure, why not? And I, and I, <laughs> now, she didn't say that, but I, I usually get an audience to laugh, so that's why I repeat that. <laughs> what, what will prayer do for you? Prayer will automatically make you ask. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened to you. 
Prayer is going to push you to automatically ask of God when you begin praying the scriptures up to God to do something. I got to tell another story. A few years ago, I was walking through Savannah, Georgia, my home, and I saw this bag lady. She was disheveled. She looked dirty, droopy clothes, dirty clothes. And I didn't even pray for her. I walked by, she said, Elmer Towns. I said, yes. And she got up and she walked over and she said, you don't recognize me. I said, no. She said, I'm Betty Reed. Oh my goodness. In high school, she, went to, she was a cheerleader. She was fit and formally. <laughs> In other words, she was cute. Had a, you know, she had those poodle skirts they would wear. I mean, she was everything. She was the, the, of all, she was the queen of the, the dance, whatever they call the spring formal. I mean, I, I always thought, I'm not good enough to ask her for a date in high school. And so I never did. She dated big, hunky guy like Charles Lomel, linebacker. Bubba Hodges, uh, he was a, a big basketball player. And we we're talking about things. I had heard she had gone through about three or four marriages. And she said to me, why didn't you ever ask me for a date? And I'm sitting there thinking, of all the girls I wanted, I wanted to go with, she was one, but I never asked her. I wonder why. And she said, you know, one day, I even came over to your house. I said, wait a minute, you walked? That's seven miles from where you lived. She said, yeah. I came over and I was walking back and forth in front of your house, hoping you could come out. We could just sit on the front steps and talk. You know, girls do those kinds of things when they're flirting. And, <laughs> and I never saw her. And I thought to myself, of all the girls I wanted to date in high school, the prettiest, the cutest, had everything going for her. And she said, I always wanted to go out with you because you worked so hard. I got up in the morning, delivered newspapers. Went back in the afternoon, delivered newspapers. I always had money because I worked hard. She said, I knew you would take care of me. And I thought, wow, I could have had a date with the greatest gal in high school, I thought. But you have not because you what? Ask not. Now, sometimes God wants to do something great for the student at Dallas Seminary. He wants to give you money you haven't thought about. He wants to give you a degree you haven't thought about. He wants to give you a mate you haven't thought about. God wants to do something great for you. And when I think in terms of what God can do, God can do it for you. And Brother Bailey, we don't know yet the greatness of what God is going to do through Dallas Seminary. I think it's the greatest. Matter of fact, when I graduated about three or four years, the alumni put out a list of a hundred Christian colleges, Bible colleges, Bible institutes in America, around the world that had Dallas alumni. And when I became a college president, I was listed there. I was so proud of Dallas and what God has done. And thank you, Bill, for that song today. Great is thy faithfulness. The first chapel at Liberty, we sang that song. Great is thy faithfulness. In my life first, I preached on faithful is he who calls you who also will do it. You automatically ask when you have. Now, when you, be, when you fulfill the scriptures, you fulfill the Bible centered. Jesus said, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, you shall ask what you will, it will be done for you. And so you are Bible centered when you pray the scriptures and then you fulfill the conditions of being specific. Uh, you must pray in Jesus, learn to ask how to pass a course. Learn to ask, I pray for wisdom. If I'm working on a topic, I always ask God. And I not only ask, I usually fast for a great, Lord, give me a topic. And Lord, give me insight. Help me to find things. Lord, as I'm doing research, in the old days, I would go to the library on a Saturday, great big pocket full of dimes, and I would do my research and walk over to the copy machine and feed that Xerox machine a dime at a page to get a page. And today, I can sit at home and my research assistant, Google, <laughs> carries me all over the world. It's a, you know, you have tools that I never had. You have some of the greatest tools in the world that I never had. When I was here at Dallas, I started writing a monthly page. Well, as a matter of fact, it was three or four pages in a missionary magazine. And we had a missionary stay with us. Uh, and this missionary had a magazine. And so he said, would you start writing for me? Would you start writing a current news account of what's happening in the world? 
And I can remember working all day, coming to, to Liberty, the old library on the third floor. And they had someone who took the time to go through all the missionary prayer letters from all over the world. And they would post them there. And I would sit down at 10 o'clock at night and work till 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning. And I would write a four or five page report of what God was doing around the world. Dallas was formative in my years. The greatest thing about Dallas are those Hebrew commentaries we used to have to write. And you had to write a 20 and 30 page commentary and you had to do two or three every semester. Those were great because they stretched me. I said, I can't do this, but I always got it done somehow or another. Now, if you are praying God's word, you will be fruitful. God says, you have not chosen me. I have chosen you and ordained you, laid hands on you that you might go and bear fruit. So may God help you to become fruitful. When you pray the scriptures, you pray with Jesus. And whatever you ask in my name, Jesus said, I will do. Now Christ dwells in you, and therefore let him and his faith work through you. And then when you begin to think about what God can do, his death, his blood, we come through, we are cleansed, we stand perfect, declared righteous, because we are in Jesus Christ. And then uh, he is praying with us. He has a, he's the high priest in heaven. I have a couple of grandchildren who are unsaved. And last night I got on my knees. Now, before my wife died last fall, we always got on our knees and prayed together. And we prayed for every member of our family, saved and unsaved. The children, the grandchildren, the great-grandchildren, and those they had married, and those who are coming to your family uh, by marriage. And so I pray for all of these. And my wife and I prayed out loud. When I lost her, I started for a few nights just praying quietly. And then all of a sudden, one day, I began to pray. Every night, I kneel and pray out loud as though my wife was still there praying for God to do something. And so last night, I'm praying, Lord, and I prayed for three. They're unsaved. They're away from you. Uh, they're living in rebellion. Jesus, pray their name before the Father. Let all heaven know, oh God, be merciful. Jesus, be merciful to them and save them. You learn to worship when you begin to pray the Psalms. You just don't pray uh, when the psalmist cries out, bless the Lord. You turn around and you say, Lord, I bless you. And so learn to take all of the great words of praise and whether you praise him, or you adore him, or you magnify him, or you exalt him, whatever word, learn to not just talk about it and learn about it. Use those phrases to magnify the Lord. You know, I can make a motel room into a sanctuary. A sanctuary is where God lives. And I can get him to come into my motel room when I worship, sometimes I'm traveled and I get up early in the morning and I don't feel like praying and I don't feel very alert. And all of a sudden my prayers bounce off the wall. And then I remember if I will worship the Lord and magnify him. Jesus said, if you will worship the father, he will seek worshipers. The father seeks worshipers and if, therefore, remember that old movie, Field of Dreams, that Iowa farmer who was building a baseball field in a cornfield somewhere in Iowa, and he kept hearing a voice, and the voice kept saying, if you build it, what will happen? They will come. So let me challenge you. If you worship the Father, he will come. Now, he's everywhere in the world, but I sometimes feel his atmospheric presence. And when I begin to pray, he comes into my motel room and it becomes a sanctuary. We sing the old song, and he walks with me and he talks with me and I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses, but he is there with me. And therefore we can have that presence when we worship and when we pray. So worship the Father in every way, faith praying. When you begin to pray the scriptures, you have faith and God answers your prayer. I'm going to end with this illustration. My mother met my father to dance. And my dad died an alcoholic. He, he, he kept us in the poorhouse because he was always spending all of his money on alcohol. 
He worked for many years at White Hardware Company in Savannah, Georgia. And mother would go down about 12 o'clock on Saturday afternoon when he got paid. And she would stand around and wait. And about 12.30, all the customers were gone and the doors were locked. And then Jack White would come out of his office, come over to the cash register in those old, old days. He would open a drawer and he would take each salesman and count out 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, one, two, sign here. There was no withholding tax, no social security tax in the old days. They just paid your cash and you just initialed and you walked away. He always made my daddy come in last. And when my daddy was there, he'd count out 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, one, two, sign here. As soon as he said, mother said, I need some money. She would jump up. I say she was waiting, she was lurking. He was waiting and as soon as she got paid, she said, now, I gotta have electric money, I gotta have rent money, I gotta have grocery money. And he would yell at her and he said, Aaron, you come here and embarrass me. And they would just yell at each other over money. And I would listen to, I'm a little kid watching them yell back and forth. She said, I gotta have the money. And she, I had a hard headed uh, mother who um, maybe she put some of her spirit within me, but she always, she got her money and she would go off. I said, hey dad, give me a quarter. I can see my father. Hmm. Here you go. And I'd always ask for a quarter. On Saturday afternoon, I went to the movies, the matinee, the shoot 'em up cowboys. In those days, it cost a dime to get in. You can't get in a movie house for a dime today. <laughs> in those days, it cost a nickel for popcorn. It still costs a nickel for popcorn. A nickel a kernel. <laughs> And you got a, a nickel for a bag of peanuts and a nickel for a Dr. Pepper. And if you're a little old kid way back in the 40s, you took your peanuts and you poured it in your Dr. Pepper and you shake it up and what would happen? You fizz and shoot. Why did you do that? Well, it was fun. <laughs> My wife heard me use this illustration and she said, did you ever think that, man, it was hard? And did you ever ask for less than a quarter just for a dime? I said, no. She said, why? I said, I knew my daddy loved me. And I knew he liked movies. It was his escapism. And he wanted me to go to movies. So she said, did you ever ask for more? more like 35 cents for two bags of popcorn? I said, no. I asked for a quarter. Somehow I got it in my head that that's what my father wanted to give me. And he gave me. Faith praying is coming to your heavenly father, knowing he loves you. He wants to give you some good things. God wants you to have an education. If you are called to service, you are called to prepare. And God's going to reach into this student body and he's going to choose the man who is the best prepared spiritually, best prepared academically, best prepared professionally. God's going to look into this auditorium and find a woman. She's going to be outstandingly prepared and all of a sudden, you're going to find yourself doing something big for God. And so pray in faith. If you pray in faith, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, say to the mountain, remove. And Jesus said, it will remove. Now, faith praying. You pray the scriptures and it will give you that faith you need. It will tell you about God. Learn to pray the scriptures and God can change your life. Now, for the faculty, there are copies of the prayer Bible for you who are here. And uh, for the student body, the copies of um, Walking with Giants, it's in the back of the auditorium. Take one, and if there's extra copies, take them to your roommate or whatever. Uh, just don't leave them here. The same with the prayer Bible, take them. And faculty, take them and don't leave them here. Thank you for letting me come today. And I'd like to pray for you. Now think of what's the number one prayer request in your heart. What would you like today for God to do more for you than anything else? Money, a job, an opening, application to a grad school somewhere else to finish up that doctor's degree. I don't know what it is. What would God want you to do? Are you willing to say that to him now? Let me pray for you as you pray for that request. Shall we pray? Father in heaven, you are omniscient. You know all things, actual and possible. And Father in heaven, we love you. 
With all of our hearts, we love you and we want to serve you. And so, Lord, I pray for each request of each student, every man, every woman, every faculty, every staff, God, for each request, I pray, look down and according to their faith and according to their request, give them the request of their hearts. Give them the desires of their hearts. I pray in Jesus' name. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thank you.